the floor is open now. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the, the, um, the comments and everything. I'm, I'm just still confused on uh, the focus of CSER with regards to electronic health records or eMERGE and whether uh, it would be important to not delineate because we want integration, but also not duplicate um, efforts in <coughs> other programs. So maybe I'll start. Um, you know, I've just recently started working with eMERGE, and my understanding to date as, is that eMERGE has been more focused on gathering phenotypes out of existing EMR data, and I've done that fairly effectively in terms of trying to collect different phenotypes. But I think as we've looked at particularly implementation of rare disease analysis, the data that's within the EHR for certain disorders isn't well captured with existing data. So I think one area that CSER could really um, have contribution to is developing better phenotype approaches that could be implemented within the EHR to better capture particularly rare phenotypes um, that I don't think are well captured today and figuring out how to structure that, as well as figuring out ways in which we could develop clinical decision support tools that respond to the types of diseases and areas of work that CSER is focused on that could be leveraged within the EHR environment that I don't think exists there today. Others want to comment? Um, I'm, I'm sorry the chairs of the CSER EHR working group aren't here, but the focus of the working group today has been on how does the genomic test reports that we're issuing appear in the electronic health record? What are the different places in which they appear before that, um, and what are really the needs to improve reporting of genetic information, particularly this level of genetic information into EHR. Um, so we published two papers today, and the last paper was really um, a survey of needs, and we, we really specified very spe specified specific issues around having test reports be in data which can then be integrated into the kind of decision support tools that was just mentioned, because currently most of the genome and exome data appears in the EHR, and most of the sites not in structured data but as PDF, and so one of our goals is to look at how labs could report structured data at a genome scale that could be used for the kind of decision support that was just talked about. I, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I really resonated with both Heidi and Dan's presentation, and I think that the, the discussion that's followed it already is, is really important. From, from my perspective, it's important not to underestimate how primitive our ability currently is to take genetic data, move it between institutions, move it between laboratories, and integrate that with phenotypic data and what needs to happen in order to get good at that so that we can then build the clinical decision support and the broader um, infrastructure to support greater use of um, genetics in, in clinical care and the, building, and the building of evidence. So I think that, I also think that the, um, the volunteer efforts that have been mentioned, the HL7 efforts, the digitized efforts, the GA4GH efforts, are great, and I think, I think it's amazing the way the community has come together to support them. But from my perspective, NHGRI is really in a unique position where it has, I know, limited resources, but funding for these types of efforts that in some way is unique. And so as a recommendation, looking at how NHGRI can potentially increase funding for the types of standards that are needed to really robustly move these data um, so that we can combine them in the way that we have to, as well as the, the core implementations and the working with the vendor community to actually stand up the needed support. Sorry, could I actually just briefly, sorry, Gail, to remind people to introduce themselves. Sandy Aronson, who is leading both Digitize and the eMERGE EHR working group. 
Uh, my question is more for Dan. One, I think one of the areas where CSER has made a very unique contribution has been in the legal regulatory analysis for genomic testing for CLIA, um, among other things, uh, including the FDA area. And I wondered if you saw the CSER New England Journal paper that Barbara Evans was the first author on. It was a special report on making a database of genomic data from clinical patients very similar to the database for adverse drug events. And uh, if, I'm sorry if you haven't seen it, but if you have seen it, if you could reflect on if that's the sort of system that could then stand alone in the future that you're addressing. Well, so, so I think that, you know, um, any database that highlights outliers um, has some utility. Right, but to the extent that we throw away 99% of uh, the evidence that we generate about uh, decisions made on behalf of every single individual by every single practitioner, and we just choose as an industry to say, well, research is this kind of 1% activity and it'll, it'll work its way back into it. And, and when we have the presumption that if we refine the inputs, we present it in a way that is easy to understand on the screen, that, that something good will happen, the right thing will happen, but we never actually check to see what did happen, then we have fundamentally a flawed model for healthcare becoming a learning industry. So that paper actually specifically uh, did not recommend capturing outliers, but recommended capturing all genomic data on clinical patients and having longitudinal <coughs> follow-up for outcomes downstream. Sounds like a good paper. <laughs> I, could I get someone from Caesar who sort of interacts with patients on a daily or weekly basis, Gail, I'm looking at you, but somebody else, to, to reflect on the differences between a guideline that says do this when you have that and a patient who's sitting in front of you with a family and how do you implement those guidelines? Is there are guidelines hard and fast? Are there is there a role for for uh, individualizing care beyond uh, even a guideline or a genotypically based guideline? Is that something that that we're still learning how to do? Is that something that is causing Dan Mesas to have a little internal convulsion because <laughs> because it seems to me that you know we we promulgate guidelines, but but at the end of the day they are exactly that. They're not hard and fast rules. So, and it seems to me that's the, 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 the interaction between the, the care system and the individual patient is where CSER has made its greatest contribution to date and, and perhaps has its greatest potential going forward. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and I suspect maybe Robert could help us with this conversation too, that when you are sitting in front of a patient, you can disagree with guidelines. You can disagree with the diagnostic criteria for a disease. You can disagree with the treatment plans that are guidelines for diseases. Many of them have actually very poor evidence bases. Um, one of the reasons we're so interested in the variant annotation area is because those guidelines are brand new, and so people don't understand them the same way. There are probably some unclear parts in those guidelines that can be fixed. Um, and so you certainly want to improve guidelines and get the best guidelines possible, but where the guidelines fail the patients actually is an important thing that CSER can capture and should be focused on. Well, and just to extend that, so let's say you do believe that you're smarter than the guideline, and you are, and you do something that uh, is a different, should, should that decision not help extend and refine the guideline? Our resistance has been that guidelines should only be implemented as decision support logic if they are perfect, right? But it turns out they only have to be useful, and if you capture every single time someone looks at a guideline and does something else, that's as valuable as, as doing what the guideline says. So it's really quite a neutral mechanism. It just depends upon the outcomes data. Yeah, and we very specifically published our uh, responses to guidelines or the inconsistency of variant calls. These are all published exercises. We've done educational sessions um, at the American College of Medical Genetics meetings about where things don't, you know, don't fall where you expect them to fall in genomics practice to outreach to the community to let these lessons be public. <laughs>
Yeah, I would build on both of those agree statements. I agree and say that the guidelines both precede and follow evidence generation in, a, in hopefully in an iterative process. And I think that's one of the beauties of CSER is that we have both taken guidelines and tested them, and we have, through our working groups, tried to generate new guidelines. And, and that, that is well established as an iterative process that's continuing and needs to, get, to continue. And I just want to add to that, because this goes back to a question Bob Nussbaum asked a little while ago. You know, if we look at the guidelines that CSER participants have been part of, a lot of them are the first step guidelines, like how do we classify variants? How do we perform next-gen sequencing? It's a general framework for returning secondary findings. Um, but they're not necessarily the, the practice guidelines for implementing that in different disease areas. And you know, Sharon mentioned the work in, in the more cancer area. But this has to happen across all the professional groups where, the, where they then develop guidance for how you, act, you know, which diseases are ripe for returning pathogenic variants. But if everybody's classifying variants wrong, then no evidence is going to be effective later. So we do have to start with these basic general guidelines for how to classify variants and get us doing the basic things correct if we're ever to build evidence later for how to implement this. But I, I think in the next phase of CSER, I would love to see, and I think CSER can play a great role in helping facilitate those clinical guidelines within different disease areas. Yes, Deborah. So I'm, I'm intrigued because I had written down rapid learning systems, which is similar to your, uh, whatever you're calling them, self-optimizing healthcare system. And I would challenge NHGRI to figure out if there are novel ways of funding this type of system um, to, to actually do this learning process with genomics incorporated into it. Um, and the clinical decisions that are made, because it's, it's a very different process and not a traditional funding mechanism that I'm aware of anywhere being used. And it's not necessarily something that every health system could do without some additional uh, funding. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a, an interesting approach to move away from this sedentary, sorry, database you know, that just people can deposit information in if they want to, as opposed to actually creating active learning for genomics. I actually don't think the investment is very large at all. In fact, you know, it's really the mindset of saying that my job as a uh, clinical decision support uh, rule generator or evidence committee is to say not only would I en encode the phenotype recognition logic and the guidance to begin it, I just think about, well, how would I know whether the right thing occurred? And implement that as the secondary phenotype to just watch for somewhere downstream in the EHR, the same way the event monitors fired the rule in the first place. So it really doesn't require either a dramatic restructuring of the technology or a lot more resources. It just, it just requires the mindset of thinking about it as part of the package of designing this kind of infrastructure. I agree. And more the funding mechanism was to have it be publicly shared <laughs> um, rather than having yeah, it being fine. done wonderfully in one system and not, um, uh, not shared um, more broadly, which, which gets somewhat to Bob's point and, and the one that was being discussed before I made that point, which is how, how, how do we how does NHGRI and CSER consider incorporating other efforts that are going on of genome sequencing, like Illumina's Understand Your Genome Project, or, un, or genomic sequencing that's not being done at CSER sites, and the learning that's coming from those sites? Because I, I feel like, <clears throat> now I'm an outsider from CSER, and Maybe this is not something to say on the record, but I feel very much like we're doing genomics, but we are outside CSER. And so therefore, what, what is being done at other sites is not being somehow incorporated and learned from by CSER. Steve, we have about five minutes left in this discussion session, so if people are burning, um, just raise your hand and we'll try to get to you. So Steve. Yeah. 
Steve, Steve Jaffe from UPenn and from uh, Caesar. So uh, I think just to um, reflect on this conversation and the point that Dan Macy's made a moment ago, I think it's actually a bit more fundamental than that because the conceptualization here, one approach, which is sort of like the Caesar approach, is to fund a, a bunch of what you might call something like phase three, four clinical trials. They are sort of single institution or a small collective in, um, clinical trials of different approaches to genomic medicine in different clinical contexts. A, a quite different approach would be to say, let's fund a learning healthcare infrastructure, uh, which, in, which sort of pulls data as much as we can from clinical interactions, observational data, which might actually be the foundation for prospective clinical trials, but sort of layered on top of a learning healthcare infrastructure. And I do think that there are some models to get to the point you made a moment ago that we can learn from, although they're not perfect. I think the uh, PCORI, PCORnet, uh, sites might be the kind of learning health care infrastructures that have some lessons for us. The cancer cooperative groups are also the sorts of things that have some lessons for us. So I think there's some infrastructures out there that might be some models that we could start to think about if this was a direction that the institute and the community wanted to go. Yeah, I think in that regard, if you just look back over the last 20 years, the closest um, closed loop system is probably pediatric oncology where the vast majority of patients go on a study which, where there are downstream outcomes captured systematically. It's good. It was a manual model, but it could be implemented with the same level of, uh, with, in a new domain, it has a lot more features of, of complexity. Katrina? I just wanted to follow up briefly on Deborah's point and say that some of the CSER um, cross-consortium activities are actually incorporating non-CSER sites. So for instance, on the study that we're doing looking at how different sites report carrier results includes clinical labs that also report carrier results. And looking at how those clinical labs may differ in their reporting from the CSER sites. But I also think there's an opportunity and possibly a recommendation could be made to have our meetings more open and include non caesar investigators who are doing similar kinds of work or a portion of our meetings um, to include non caesar investigators so that we could have more of a two-way dialogue. I was just going to say, as somebody involved in the children's oncology group and having done implementation of pharmacogenetics for four or five years, that the most expensive part of those operations is capturing the outcomes. So I agree with you, it's a great thing and that it also takes a change in mindset to get people to do it, but it is by far the most difficult and expensive part of the operation but, but is that to figure out what those outcomes are, even if the outcomes are as simple as how was prescribing changed? Did you really withhold codeine for that patient? How long do you look in the future to decide whether you withheld codeine for that patient? They're very manual. We have a terrific EHR that's fully penetrant, but it's a very expensive manual process. But so that, as, that's the point. It's manual. As one, as one implementer to another. I mean, I agree with that. <laughs> but but uh, the problem is that we just don't have systems. We, you know, I don't. I won't speak for you, but I know when we put our system in place, we spend a huge amount of time thinking about the clinical decision support and what it would look like and having it wordsmith by lawyers and pharmacists and informaticists, but we did not spend, you know, a tenth of that time thinking about how we're going to capture downstream results. So I think we're sort of suffering from that. We recognize it, and, and that would certainly be something that uh, many people could work on. Are we talked out?